Good evening and welcome again to Free to Choose from the Barber Surgeons Hall here in the City of London. This is the fourth of a series of six programmes devoted to explaining, expounding, debating, criticising the economic philosophy and some of the political ideas of the noted American economist and Nobel Prize winner, Professor Milton Friedman. And here with me in front of an invited audience of economists and bankers and others interested in Professor Friedman's ideas, I have a three-man panel of Mr. Nigel Lawson, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, Professor Maurice Peston of Queen Mary's College, and Mr. Neil Kinnock, the Labour Member of Parliament. They'll have an opportunity to challenge Professor Friedman face-to-face -face about his ideas, and in particular, about his conviction that governments and parliaments really have no business trying to impose greater equality on society, and that when they do, they usually do more harm than good. But first, as usual, we start with Professor Friedman's personal statement of his basic arguments on film, created equal. <laughs> From Victorian novelists to modern reformers, a favorite device to stir our emotions is to contrast extremes of wealth and of poverty. We are expected to conclude that the rich are responsible for the deprivations of the poor. That they are rich at the expense of the poor. Whether it is in the slums of New Delhi or in the affluence of Las Vegas, it simply isn't fair that there should be any losers. Life is unfair. There's nothing fair about one man being born blind and another man being born with sight. There's nothing fair about one man being born of a wealthy parent and one of an impecunious parent. There's nothing fair about Muhammad Ali having been born with a skill that enables him to make millions of dollars one night. There's nothing fair about Marlena Dietrich having great legs that we all want to watch. There's nothing fair about any of that. But on the other hand, don't you think a lot of people who like to look at Marlena Dietrich's legs benefited from nature's unfairness in producing a Marlena Dietrich? What kind of a world would it be if everybody was an absolute identical duplicate of anybody else? You might as well destroy the whole world and just keep one specimen left for a museum. In the same way, it's unfair that Muhammad Ali should be a great fighter and should be able to earn millions. But wouldn't it be, would it not be even more unfair to the people who like to watch him if you said that in the pursuit of some abstract ideal of equality, we're not going to let Muhammad Ali get more for one night's fight than the lowest man on the totem pole can get for a day's unskilled work on the docks? You could do that. But the result of that would be to deny people the opportunity to watch Muhammad Ali. I doubt very much that he would be willing to subject himself to the kind of fights he's gone through if he were to get the pay of an unskilled docker. This beautiful estate, its manicured lawns, its trees, its shrubs, was built by men and women who were taken by force in Africa and sold as slaves in America. These kitchen gardens were planted and tended by them to furnish food for themselves and their master, Thomas Jefferson, the squire of Monticello. It was Jefferson who wrote these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words, penned by Thomas Jefferson at the age of 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, have served to define a basic ideal of the United States throughout its history. Much of our history has revolved about the definition and redefinition of the concept of equality, about the attempt to translate it into practice. What did Thomas Jefferson mean by the words, all men are created equal? He surely did not mean that they were equal and or identical in what they could do or in what they believed. After all, he was himself a most remarkable person. At the age of 26, he designed this beautiful house at Monticello, supervised its construction, and indeed is said to have worked on it with his own hands. He was an inventor, a scholar, an author, 
a statesman, governor of Virginia, president of the United States, minister to France. He helped shape and create the United States. What he meant by the words equal can be seen in the phrase endowed by their creator. To Thomas Jefferson, all men are equal in the eyes of God. They all must be treated as individuals who have each separately a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, practice did not conform to the ideals in Jefferson's life or in ours as a nation. He agonized repeatedly during his lifetime about the con conflict between the institution of slavery and the fine words of the Declaration. Yet, during his whole life, he was a slave owner. This is the city palace in Jaipur, the capital of the Indian state of Rajasthan. It's just one of the elegant houses that were built here 150 years ago by the prince who ruled this land. There are no more princes, no more Maharajas in India today. All titles were swept away by the government of India in its quest for equality. But as you can see, there are still some people here who live a very privileged life. The descendants of the Maharaja finance this kind of life partly by using other palaces as hotels for tourists. Tourists who come to India to see how the other half lives. This side of India, the exotic glamorous side, is still very real. Everywhere in the world there are gross inequalities of income and wealth. They offend most of us. A myth has grown up that free market capitalism increases such inequalities, that the rich benefit at the expense of the poor. Nothing could be further from the truth. Wherever the free market has been permitted to operate, the ordinary man has been able to attain levels of living never dreamed of before. Nowhere is the gap between rich and poor. Nowhere are the rich richer and the poor poorer than in those societies that do not permit the free market to operate, whether they be feudal societies where status determines position or modern centrally planned economies where access to government determines position. Central planning was introduced in India in considerable part in the name of equality. The tragedy is that after 30 years, it is hard to see any significant improvement in the lot of the ordinary person. Ever since the end of World War II, British domestic policy has been dominated by the search for greater equality. Measure after measure has been adopted designed to take from the rich and give to the poor. Unfortunately, the results have been very different from those that were intended by the high-minded people who were quite properly offended by the class structure that dominated Britain for centuries. There have been vast redistributions of wealth, but it is very hard to say that the end result has been a more equitable distribution. Instead, new classes of privileged have been created to replace or supplement the old. The bureaucracy, secure in their jobs, protected against inflation both when they work and after they retire. The trade unions, who profess to represent the most downtrodden workers, but who in fact consist of the highest paid laborers in the land, the aristocrats of the labor movement, and the new millionaires, the people who have been cleverest, most ingenious at finding ways around the rules, the regulations, the laws that have emanated from over there. 
who have found ways to avoid paying tax on the income they have acquired, to get their wealth and their money overseas beyond the hands of the tax collector. A vast reshuffling, yes. A greater equity, hardly. The Yehudi Menuhin School in the south of England is also a place of privilege. Musically talented children from all over the world compete for a chance to come here to study. Much of the moral fervor behind the drive for equality comes from the widespread belief that it is not fair that some children should have a great advantage over others simply because they happen to have wealthy parents. Of course it's not fair. But is there any distinction between the inheritance of property and the inheritance of what at first sight looks very different? These youngsters have inherited wealth, not in the form of bonds or stocks, but in the form of talent. That 15-year-old is an accomplished cellist. His father is a distinguished violinist. It's no accident that most of the children at this school come from musical families. The inheritance of talents is no different from an ethical point of view from the inheritance of other forms of property, of bonds, of stocks, of houses, or of factories. Yet many people resent the one, but not the other. Look at the same issues from the point of view of the parent. If you want to give your child a special chance, there are different ways you can do it. You can buy him an education, an education that will give him skills enabling him to earn a higher income. Or you can buy him a business. Or you can leave him property, the income from which will enable him to live better. Is there any ethical difference between these three ways of using your property? Or again, if the state leaves you any money to spend over and above taxes. Should you be permitted to spend it on riotous living, but not permitted to leave it to your children? The ethical issues involved are subtle and complex. They are not to be resolved by resort to such simplistic formulas as fair shares for all. Indeed, if you took that seriously, it's the youngsters with less musical skill, not those with more, who should be sent to this school in order to compensate for their inherited disadvantage. Nothing, can I lose? To tie here, nothing, nothing. 320 on the tie. And 160. Against the marker, one. Okay. Oh, Safe okay. anchor. 600 here in the end. When the evening started, all of these players had about the same number of chips in front of them. But as the play progressed, they surely didn't. Some won, some lost. By the end of the evening, some of them will have big pile of chips, others will have small ones. They'll be big winners, they'll be big losers. In the name of equality, should the winnings be redistributed to the losers so that everybody ends up where he started? That would take all the fun out of the game. Even the losers wouldn't like that. They might like it tonight, but would they come back again to play 
if they knew that whatever happened, they'd end up exactly where they had started. We're only one minute away from double jackpot time. When we're in the double jackpot time, watch the double jackpot board. With the number of your spots, you're going to double jackpot. Now, select your favorite machine to check this game. And listen to the horn after the countdown. But what does Las Vegas have to do with the real world? A great deal more than you might think. It's one very important part of our life in highly concentrated form. Every day, all of us are making decisions that involve gambles. Sometimes they're big gambles, as when we decide what occupation to pursue or whom to marry. More often, they're small gambles, as when we decide whether to cross the street against the traffic. But each time, the question is, who shall make the decision, we or somebody else? We can make the decision only if we bear the consequences. That's the economic system that has transformed our society in the past century and more. That's what gave the Henry Fords, the Thomas Alva Edisons, the Christian Barnards, the incentives to produce the miracles that have benefited us all. It's what gave other people the incentive to provide them with the finance for their ventures. Of course, there were lots of losers along the way. We don't remember their names. But remember, they went in with their eyes open. They knew what they were doing. And win or lose, we, society, benefited from their willingness to take a chance. Lance Van Orman has an idea. He's taking a chance. Who knows? I suppose it's possible that we might all benefit from it one day. But that isn't why he's taking a chance. He's doing it just because he wants to get rich. Well, the idea is that if you have an oil spill in the ocean or in the river, you want to try and get it under control. And what I'm going to simulate here is put some of this oil down. There's your oil spill of major proportions. Now, this product, what I can do is, unfortunately, what I can't show you here is that if you put this product down with an application system, you wring the oil spill in such a manner. Now, the application system will make it much finer, and it'll control this. And I don't know if you can see what's happening to the oil yet, but it's just literally being drawn into this stuff. Now, as I spray it across the top, now it's starting to draw it in. Now, I've got way more than I need. This controls like 10 times its weight in oil. And it will not sink. It's been chemically treated. It's cellulose. It's been chemically treated so that it will, in fact, not do anything with the water. It hates water, but it loves oil. Now, I don't know if you can see. We have containment devices, and that's what we're going to use this with. Now, you can see that it's just taken a very little amount of this oil-absorbing product, which we call oil eater, to pick this up. Now, the nice thing about it is that after that oil spill is there, we have the system to do what I'm doing with my hand, and that's pick all this up. There's the oil out of the product. Now, if you want the oil back, that's not a big problem, if I can keep it all under control. The oil will come out, and there we go, allowing it. I don't know if you can see. There you go. Now, what I've done is I quit my regular job, and I mortgaged everything I've got. And it's quite, quite a risk to do this, but the product works. You can see it works. And when it goes, I'm going to make millions. People who are free make their own choices. These two men do a dangerous, noisy, filthy job. They don't do it because they like it. They do it because it's well paid. That's their choice. 
This young man has given up any thought of a steady, well-paid career in order to take a job on a golf course. He wants to become a professional golfer. It's a big gamble, but it's one that he has decided to take. When people are free, they are able to use their own resources most effectively, and you have a great deal of productivity, a great deal of opportunity. The major beneficiaries are always a small man. The man who has power, who's at the top of a society, he's going to do well whatever kind of a society you have. It's the society which gives the small man the opportunity to go his way, which is going to benefit him the most. And that is why, if you ask, where in the world do ordinary people have the greatest opportunity for themselves and their children? It's not in Russia. It's not, on the other hand, in India. It's in places like the United States, like Hong Kong, like Britain, as it was. Not so clearly Britain as it is. For much of this century, the British have tried to use the law to impose equality with very indifferent results. The failure of the drive for equality is not because the wrong measures were adopted, not because they were badly administered, not because the wrong people administered it. The failure is much more fundamental. It is because that drive goes against the most basic instinct of all human beings. In the words of Adam Smith, the uniform, constant, and uninterrupted effort of every man to better his condition, to improve his own lot, and to make a better world for his children and his children's children. When the law interferes with that pursuit, everyone will try to find a way around. He will try to evade the law, he will break the law, or he will emigrate from the country. All of those things have happened in Great Britain. There is no moral code that justifies laws fixing prices or fixing wages or preventing a man from earning a living unless he joins a union and submits himself to the discipline of the union or forcing you to buy more expensive goods at home when cheaper goods are available from abroad. When the law prohibits things that most people regard as moral and proper, they are going to break the law. Only fear of punishment, not a sense of justice, will cause them to obey the law. And when people start breaking one set of laws, there's a strong tendency for the lack of respect for the law to extend to all, even to those which everyone regards as moral and proper, laws against violence, theft, vandalism. Hard as it may be to believe, the growth of crude criminality in Britain owes much to the drive for equality. In addition, that has driven some of the ablest, best trained, most vigorous people out of Britain, much to the benefit of the United States and other countries that have given them a greater opportunity to use their talents for their own benefit. And finally, who can doubt the effect which the drive for equality has had on efficiency and productivity? Surely, that is one of the main reasons why Britain has fallen so far behind its continental neighbors, the United States, Japan, and other countries, in the improvement of the economic lot of the ordinary man over the past 30 years. Everywhere and at all times, economic progress has meant far more to the poor than to the rich. Wherever progress has been achieved, it has relieved the poor from back-breaking toil. It has also enabled them to enjoy the comforts and conveniences that have always been available to the rich. During the 19th century, and especially after the Civil War and on into the 20th century, the idea of equality came to have a much more definite and specific meaning than the abstract concept of equality before God. It came more and more to mean that everyone should have the same opportunity to make what he could of his capacities. That all careers should be open to people on the basis of their talents, independently of the race or religion or belief or social class that characterized them. This concept of equality of opportunity offers no conflict at all with the concept of freedom, on the, on the contrary, 
They reinforce one another, and it is no doubt the concept that even today is most widely held. But in the 20th century, beginning especially abroad, and at a later date in this country, a very different concept, a very different ideal has begun to emerge. That is the ideal that everyone should be equal in income, in level of living, in what he has. The idea that the economic race should be so arranged that everybody ends at the finish line at the same time, rather than that everyone starts at the beginning line at the same time. This concept raises a very serious problem for freedom. It is clearly in conflict with it, since it requires that the freedom of some be restricted in order to provide greater benefits to others. The society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. Well, it's a pretty tough indictment, amongst other things, of much, much of Britain's post-war uh, social and uh, economic history, as well as in other countries. And in a moment, I want to bring in our panel of Nigel Lawson, Maurice Peston, and Neil Kinnock. But first, Professor Friedman, can I press you a little bit on the logic of the film? You, you spend a good deal of time, I think, trying to show that the notion of absolute equality is wrong or absurd or carries too high a price in terms of uh, uh, freedom. But you also seem to be implying that it is wrong for a society to concern itself at all with the distribution of income, at least as a basis for uh, the government or the Congress or Parliament intervening in the process and taking money through taxation from one person and giving it to another in order to create greater equality. Why shouldn't a society have a greater degree of equality, stopping short of absolute equality, as one objective along with security, along with prosperity, along with the environment, along with other objectives which societies have? It should. There's no disagreement between us on objectives. I would like a world in which there were differences. We don't want people to be identical. Uh, as we say in the film, it would be a terrible world. We, but we would like differences to be moderate. We would like to eliminate some of the vast differ differences of income that today disfigure the world. The crucial question is how do you go about doing it? And the key point of the film is that if a government goes directly to the task of trying to reduce differences of income by taking from some and giving to other, it almost invariably ends up being counterproductive. It ends up increasing differences rather than reducing them. It ends up giving power to some people over other people. It ends up not only doing that, but destroying or reducing incentives so the end, that you end up both with a lower level of living and no reduction of those differences which you want well, to achieve. Let me put a supplementary question to you in that case. Why did you say to me in an earlier program when we, when we were discussing uh, social security and you were saying you were against our system and indeed the American system of social security and welfare, why did you say to me in that context that it wasn't that you wanted these people to be neglected, you just wanted a different system and you were in favor of what you called a, a negative income tax as a way of giving cash to people who are worse off. Now, isn't that doing exactly what you said, the government coming into the picture in order to correct to some degree the inequalities of income in a society? You're quite right. And my answer to you there was incomplete. And I should have gone farther. I should have said, I would hope in my ideal world that we could do without the negative income tax as well. That if we really had a world with real freedom, with real equality of opportunity, you would end up with so small a measure of distress. There unquestionably would be some distressed people. You're never going to get rid of that. That it could be handled well by private charity. But there is a problem of going from where you are now to where you would like to go. We have, unwisely in my opinion, induced very large numbers of people to become dependent on the state. We cannot in good conscience throw them out in the street. We can't cut off overnight and say now, Go, and go on your own. And therefore, I have always regarded the negative income tax as a transitional mechanism, as a way which would, uh, you call it here a reverse income tax, but I, uh, uh, it's an old idea, but I take credit for inventing the term negative income tax, which is why I guess I use it. I have always regarded the negative income tax as a transitional mechanism for getting from where we are to where we would like to be. Now, there's one other point I want to make. 
I believe there's a big difference between relieving distress and trying to follow a policy of eliminating differences in income. There's all the difference in the world, in my opinion, between 90% of us deciding to impose taxes on ourselves to help 10% who are in trouble, and 10% imposing taxes on 10%, in, or, or I should say 80% imposing taxes on 10% to help another 10%. You end up with the old parable of the forgotten man, in which A and B decide to tax C in order to help D with a good deal of the money raised from C ending up in the pockets of A and B on the way. Well, let me bring in Neil Kinnock here. Neil, I think you uh, won't complain if I call you a strong egalitarian, and you have that reputation. Do, in your advocacy of equality, greater equality, lesser inequality, do you acknowledge to yourself that there is a price, possibly a big price, in terms of either efficiency or freedom or the other things that were mentioned in the film, and do you just say, I don't care, I just give higher priority to e equality, or do you deny there's a trade-off between these two no, things? No, I think one is a function of the other. I think where the monetarists and uh, Professor Friedman particularly are wrong is that they will the ends, as he just did, without willing the means. And the transitional period he talks to about ignores the fact that by political action, and the action of those who have wealth, they will determine levels of negative income tax and other factors at a level which ensures the perpetuity of those who are dispossessed or unfortunate for the greater glory of themselves. Now, the system that I see, both in terms of the advancement of productivity, the reduction of costs, and the general advance both of political freedom and of economic emancipation, is that that starting line, at very least, should be one of equal capability and equal access and equal opportunity. And it isn't that we should finish up, as Professor Friedman said uh, on the film, at exactly the same finishing post, but we should start off on the same level. Now, by definition, the Friedmanites would deny that because they want a system, an ideal world, which is run by gangsters and Las Vegas uh, gamblers, basically for a world of gangsters and Las Vegas gamblers, and they are the only perfect products of that monetarist system. They must, at some stage, because of their political predilections and the power that they will eventually accumulate politically as a consequence of their economic accumulation, deny the opportunity for equality and therefore reduce the possibilities of both economic advance, productive advance, innovation, inventiveness, because they become not only a monopoly of economics but a monopoly and finance, but a monopoly of power as well. Where, where, and he's introduced no formula that can ensure against that. Where, do, where did the gangsters come into the story? Well, the gangsters, <laughs> I mean, in <laughs> Professor Friedman's society, because of uh, the uh, either natural endowments of talent, and of course brutality is a talent in, in a perverse sense, uh, or because of the rights in, of inheritance, or because of the way in which the wealthy who have power will run society for that purpose and not levy themselves voluntarily, incidentally, Professor, uh, in order to benefit the poor. Because of all those things, the most natural triumph of that kind of society is to value the gangster because he's got an advantage in the demand and supply economy, in the market economy, uh, he is uh, paid more, he therefore has a higher value in the strict economic term to value the gangster more than the nurse or the grave digger or the dustbin collector. And that's the perversity of that system, even though I acknowledge that it's the product of a 19th century liberal mind that would like a perfect world, but refuses to will the means of securing that end. Before Professor Friedman comes back, let me bring in Nigel Lawson. Mr. Lawson, to what extent does the government which you represent, anyway, in this discussion, uh, conceive itself to be in part or in whole rolling back that uh, egalitarian tide of post-war history in Britain which was described in the film? I think we would go <clears throat> along with Professor Friedman to a considerable extent, uh, that this uh, tide of egalitarianism is what led to tax rates being far too high, far too high probably at all levels, but certainly far too high at the top levels, where we had, uh, until the last budget, the first budget of uh, this government, we had a top rate of tax on earned income of 83%, we brought that down to 60%, we had a top rate of tax on savings income of 98%, the ludicrous, which was not doing anybody any good, it was just pandering to envy, which was known as a desire for equality, it had nothing to do with equality at all, and we brought that down to 75%. Because it, you do have to have incentives, and you do have to have incentives at all levels. Uh, you have to have incentives so that the man who is working is better off than the man who is not working at all. 
uh, that otherwise the general standard of living of the people as a whole will be worse off. And I cannot see anybody in their right minds wanting to see that. And so, to a very considerable extent, we do share the analysis of, uh, of Milton Friedman. Though you are still presiding over massive transfers of income in the sense that huge amounts of uh, income are collected in tax and huge amounts are paid out in social security benefits, and supplementary benefits and, other, in, and in other ways. Yes, indeed. I said a very considerable thing. Uh, of course there has to be the relief of poverty. Of course that is a duty, I would say, and the government would say, of the state. Uh, the more that voluntary agencies can do, the better. Uh, but I think that uh, Professor Friedman's ideal world in which the state can bow out, can opt out altogether, is a world that I shall never live in and I suspect he will never live in either. So that uh, that responsibility is there. But the uh, system that we had had in this country went far beyond that. Um, Anthony Crossland, the late Anthony Crossland, the last socialist thinker that has been in this country, died some years ago now. And in his, <laughs> in his, last, uh, in his last published uh, Fabian tract, he said this, the argument for more equality is based not on any direct material gain to the poor, but on the claims of social and natural justice. But I must say, I'm more interested in helping the poor reject the claims of social and nat natural Well, if they, are, if they are antipathetic to the, and hostile to the helping the poor, then indeed I am. But you like these on your terms, don't Yes, exactly. But it also Press ignores, Bess. you see, there really is a fundamental difference in the view. Uh, it, and the clash between equality and liberty, I think, is the interesting intellectual question. And some of us would argue, you see, that the kind of society one is talking about, if you like the Adam Smith society, is inherently unstable in, in the sense in which I think Adam Smith himself recognized in the sense that that's, that society, the famous quotation of businessmen seldom get together but to exploit, etc., etc. It's a society that is producing more and more inequality and, as it were, in a sense, destroying itself in terms of competition and that sort of thing. Now, what one says then, and I, I, I don't know anybody, certainly not around this table, who's saying that the alternative is therefore a society of complete equality, what one argues is against these forces of great inequality, in order to preserve freedom, society has to produce rather less inequality. And therefore, I always find it very strange, as I read Professor Friedman and others, to find those of us who believe strongly that what one's doing is actually providing the foundation for freedom by encouraging rather less inequality than actually exists, which is, after all, all that happens. Um, are accused of being those who are taking us on the road to the Gulag Archipelago, and I just simply don't see that. What I see is an attempt moderately, not terribly successfully, but a little successfully in our own country, to make society a slightly better place, because people do have some concept of a better world as opposed to a poorer world. Now, in some sense, Professor Friedman perhaps doesn't disagree with that. He simply disagrees on the method in terms of how you might set about doing it. Um, again, I myself don't see this imposed state. I see a state, again, trying to a limited extent, but not terribly well, but trying to do some of the right things. Uh, what I don't understand is then the argument that one is somehow doing, destroying freedom in doing that. That's the bit I get very upset about, just as it's very embarrassing for those of us who do stay in this country to be told that we're the second-rate ones and all the excellent ones are all emigrating like mad. Um, <laughs> but they, of course, as Professor Friedman knows, they've been emigrating like mad for 150 years, long before um, equality became the so-called dominant... Thing. I also don't recognize, if I may, just had this, la this last point on crime. Um, the uh, greatest growth of crime in this country is by the 14 to 16 year old age group, who I hardly feel are affected by uh, these incentive matters at this stage. And the greatest growing crime is criminal damage, vandalism, which again I don't see very closely connected with policies to do with equality. Um, and indeed also I suppose one ought to ask about crime in other countries left, uh, not to leave out Las Vegas. Is that, can I make one other point on, on, on Las Vegas? I thought the main point about gambling is that the gamblers as a group were net losers and uh, as it were the bookmakers were the net gainers and therefore it's quite wrong to suggest in the film that there's a redistribution between gamblers. The main redistribution is from gamblers to those who never gamble, namely those who make the book. Well, you know, that's a uh, fundamental uh, point. The two, uh, the two of you have raised a great many points and I want to try to take a number of them up. Just to take the last one first. The people who gamble in Las Vegas are gambling because they want to. Oh, yes. They are getting their money's worth. They are oh, paying a fee to absolutely. the people who are providing the gambling services. But they are also showing that they want to take risks, that they want to take an opportunity to improve their lot at the cost of losing a lot. But I want to get back to fundamentals because I believe what both of you have said is a gross travesty on what the facts are. 
It simply is wrong to assert that in a world of economic freedom and political freedom, you have an accumulation of monopolies. It's also wrong to assert that in that world you have a world of gangsters ruling gangsters. If I were going to be as demagogic as Mr. Kinnock, I would ask him whether he would rather have a world run by civil servants for civil servants at the expense of the ordinary people. They're not the alternatives. Well, but let's go back Don't to the let's go back analogy. let's go back to the facts. In the 19th century, which in the United States was a period of great economic freedom, when the government played a very small role, when total expenditures of the federal government were 3% of the national income. You had the greatest outpouring of private philanthropic eleemosynary activity the world has ever seen. The same thing was true in this country. Do you realize that three quarters of the beds in your hospitals under the health service are in hospitals that were built in the 19th century by private individuals expressing their private charitable impulses? Yes, but if you look at the there. distribution no. of income, if you look at the distribution of income, the period of economic uh, freedom was a period in which the poor were getting better off, in which the differences in income between the rich and the poor was getting smaller and not larger. If you look at the present situation and you ask, who are the people who, how do you make money in today's world? How do you become a millionaire in today's world? It's by getting special privileges from government. What kind of nonsense is this, that government is cutting down? If I want to get rich in the United States, the easiest way to do it is to have the government to give me a television channel. I will immediately be a millionaire. Two years ago, three years ago, if I wanted to get rich in Great Britain, fortunately the conservative government has eliminated this. The best way to do it was to get a permit to get foreign exchange. You had foreign exchange control. In every country in the world, if I take India, where you have tremendous differences of income, who are the rich people in India? They are the people who have special privileges from government. So government is a source of, of differences of income, of special privilege, of monopoly. Let me take you, let me get away, if I may, for well, a moment, from the moment, this abstract much level. Much you deserve. I want to get away to a, <laughs> I want to go to a very specific issue and see how you stand on it. Those of you who say you are in favor of equality, there is one program in my country and in your country, which in my opinion is the greatest scandal that exists. It's a program which imposes heavy taxes on poor people to provide large benefits to people from the middle and upper classes. That program is the financing of higher education. I think it's a disgrace and a scandal. I myself am a beneficiary of it. But I want to ask you the question. If you are really an egalitarian, then you must share with me the view that people who go to institutions of higher education should pay the whole of their own costs and not be financed by taxes on people who are not able to go to institutions of higher education. Let, let yes. Will you share yeah. that with yes. me? By all means, we'll have a debate about the financing of higher education, but let's make the most fundamental point of your misrepresentation of the actual history of philanthropy in this country. See, what I was taught was that philanthropists, taught by people who were the victims of philanthropists, who uh, employed them for six days of the week and then victimized for them for the other uh, day of the week that they always spent enough to keep themselves away from the guillotine, but never enough to put themselves in the workhouse. And actually, until we had the collective financing of the health service and so much else in this society, the freedoms of the overwhelming majority of the people were so cramped by their economic incarceration that they couldn't even have a political expression. Now, I think you've really got to revise your view, whatever you do about your own country, about the actual progress of collective advancement in this country. And the fact that the talent that has been released and the waste that has been cut down, the waste of talent that's been reduced as a consequence of collective financing, including the higher education program, is so immense as to absolutely destroy your analogy. The other thing is, in your country, I don't think you take enough account when you mention the 19th century of the fact that you had an infinity of possibility of geographical and material expansion. You were attributing all to a human capacity. Without that opportunity, the human capacity could have got nowhere. And the refugees that took advantage of it, including possibility, possibly your own forebears, were refugees from a system in which there was no equality, in which the struggle was for securing equality, and which the rights not only of politics but of property were secured historically by a very small class that uh, 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 allowed and, and indeed uh, made in, uh, necessary and intentional 
the movement out of that society. We don't suffer losses because of the equality advancing in our community or in other communities. We suffered many more losses when there was less equality and people had to take refuge in the possibilities of economic emancipation elsewhere. There is no doubt that in America the availability of resources was relevant. But it was a minor factor, as is documented and demonstrated today by the experience of Hong Kong, where there are no resources. Oh. You cannot say that Hong Kong's progress has been due to resources. But it's strategically It's demonstrated unique. by the progress of Japan after the Meiji Restoration, which has very limited resources, demonstrated by the progress of Taiwan, which has very limited resources. Oh. Natural resources are a minor element in the progress of humankind. Mm. The major element in the progress of humankind is freedom of people to and use their capacities. Professor Friedman, and I want to go back on the discussion the of, of an earlier program. But let me ask Professor Preston, what can you tell us about the actual facts of the history of income distribution in Britain, particularly since the war? Income distribution and wealth distribution? Yes, well... Uh, has it got more equal? It How has much? got slightly more equal. I mean, wealth has got a little more equal. Income has got a little more equal. But you see, I'm not clear what Professor Friedman's point is. I think, I think his point is actually cleverer than that. He's saying we tried to make it more equal and we didn't even succeed. So he's not arguing that we've got more equal and that's our trouble. He's arguing we mm -hmm. tried to exactly. get more equal, we failed, exactly. and that's our trouble. But I want to so get therefore he's not the same as Nigel Lawson who seems to be under the impression that we actually got a lot more equal. We've got a little more equal in he our society. That people paid 83%. There are tremendous pressures all the time towards inequality. As I say, I think that there are moderate pressures, and having advised governments myself, I'm staggered at how these alleged left-wing governments are supposed to be so strong on equality. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a job to move people, ministers at all. Uh, but we've moved a teeny bit towards <laughs> more equality, which I think makes our society a slightly better place and helps us to maintain freedom, which is my fundamental point, that a society that became too unequal would people would simply lose faith in the democratic processes and therefore f far from such a society supporting freedom it would be destroyed. And that's again Tony Croston's point. No, all. no, but I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you completely. Fundamental. Where we disagree is very differently. I agree with you that in a society like, for example, some of the South American countries where you have enormous inequality, it's almost impossible to have political freedom. What, the, where we disagree is that I believe that a free economy promotes equal lesser differences, that it reduces differences, and why? Because in such a society, a person may temporarily do very, very well, but there are a hundred other people who are there to cut them down. You have the competition of others. But I want to go back and get you on the record on this one disgraceful program in Britain and the United States. Are you in favor of a full charging? for higher education. No, I'm not willing to go to full charging because, as Alfred Marshall pointed out, there are benefits to the community from Very higher dubious. education. But nonetheless, Alfred Marshall was another economist of some distinction oh. that we, we could at least quote. He was a great economist. Uh, exactly. And he did believe that, uh, as it were, many of those flowers that blush unseen, the muting glorious Milton, yes. as you're well aware, <laughs> uh, could be helped uh, if we had these programs. But nonetheless, I entirely agree with you that the redistributive effects of higher education are regressive and wrong and that we ought to have programs that move in the other direction. Let me add that whenever as an advisor to governments of the left that I've said that, I'm always told, ah, isn't that what Professor Friedman believes? <laughs> and I say, well, something similar. And they say, right, nothing doing. Uh, <laughs> Professor Friedman, let, let, let me press you on the slightly broader point. Which you are you willing, in, in Peter? Are you willing? I want to get you down on record and Nigel on Cha record. Chairman of the BBC discussions never have opinions about anything. <laughs> 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 I want, to press, I want to press you, by way of a Fine. question, on really one of the important statements of a more general character that you made in the film, and that was that there was, as I paraphrase it, there was no ethical difference between the inheritance of talent and the inheritance of property, and therefore no basis for a different political, fiscal treatment of those two things. And I would like to ask you whether you're absolutely sure that that is correct. After all, somebody could say that inequalities are a disfiguring to society. Some of them come about for reasons which we decide are necessary in order to induce people to do certain nasty kinds of jobs, in order to give people enough incentive to do various things. We have to tolerate certain kinds of uh, inequality, but we don't plan to tolerate any inequalities that go beyond what are necessary uh, for those purposes. Now, obviously, the cultivation of a talent, unless it's in some sense an antisocial talent, is going to be of benefit to an economy uh, and to a society as a whole. Therefore, a society has strong reasons for 
not only recognizing the fact that talent is sometimes inherited, but for allowing it to be cultivated. It doesn't follow from that that all property, or even necessarily the bulk of property that's inherited, has that same characteristic, that it is necessary that it should remain in those hands for it to be cultivated. Some may, sometimes, but the two are different in that respect, are they not? No. In both cases, it may or may not be necessary to provide differences in income to have the resource cultivated. Most people, in fact, uh, I think the argument goes almost the other way. Most people who inherit talent have a tremendous desire to use that talent. And in fact, the market, in my opinion, values talent much more highly than is necessary to get the talent used. I don't object to that. They value it because the customers enjoy it. The people who go to watch, you take, take Muhammad Ali. Uh, I don't think it would have taken as large an income as he got in order to induce him to go out there and knock somebody out. He enjoyed it. He loved it. Not to mention the adulation. But is there anything wrong? The people who went to see him wanted to pay that money. They wanted to pay for his services. He was able to get it. If somebody else can come along and take it away, fine. In the same way with property income. It's also to the benefit of society to have property used properly and effectively. If you say to people, you are not going to be able to leave your children property. You give them an incentive to waste their property, not to save it, not to accumulate it. If you look at where capital accumulation has come from, it has come dominantly in the, in the world from the desire, from a family feeling, from a desire to leave so property to your children. What about when it goes beyond that? Purpose. I think that, just I think that there, oh, we want to get back to the, to the question that, or the basic question of equality. I think we want to probe Neil Kinnock and maybe Morris Payson a, a little bit further. I, mean, the, I think the argument, uh, the argument in favor of allowing people to give uh, something to their children uh, is an argument not only in favor of freedom, incidentally, but in favor of a basic human instinct. Absolutely. And I certainly don't believe that it makes sense for any government to try and conduct a policy which runs totally counter to the most basic and innate instincts of mankind, uh, which this one does. But the, furthermore, furthermore the, the question of uh, equality, Neil Kinnock says that he doesn't really believe in equality of outcome. He doesn't really believe that everybody should be exactly equal. That's what he said, I think. I Did think it's an impossibility that? to say right, that. Right. He, uh, he d I'm not sure whether he's a bit equivocal now. He's not sure whether he oh. believes in it or not. Uh, <laughs> but I think, that it's, uh, I think that it is a very important thing because if you are not saying that everybody should be exactly the same, the man who works hard should earn exactly the same as the man who works, doesn't work hard or the man who doesn't work at all. That the, that the first division footballer should be pay, paid exactly the same as the fourth division the footballer. Um, okay, he doesn't say that now. So he has abdicated the principle. Well, I think that once the principle abdicated, then we can perhaps have a more intelligent discussion because we're not talking about equality now. What we are talking about is uh, whether the sort of uh, redistributive policies which have been pursued in this country uh, for many years now, um, particularly the very, very high rates of uh, taxation on the higher incomes, whether these have gone too far. Now, up till now, it has never been possible to have a debate because it has been held on, on the left to be axiomatic that equality of outcome is the ideal. Therefore, any departure from that must be wrong. They have not been able to conceive of the possibility that we may have gone too far. And I agree that in what they have done, in the policies they've been pursuing, they haven't achieved equality. What they have done, as I said earlier, is depress the living standards that people hold. Obviously, if, if you create a, a climate of thought in which business success is something to be ashamed of, then you won't get business success. Well, I and if you don't get business success, shouldn't then you're be charging 22 percent of small businessmen in that case. Oh, no, but look, the, the, the negating argument there is that here's a, a government that uses all the vocabulary, the encouragement of the small man that Milton Friedman talks about, and then adopts the economic policies of the big man. So negating the possibility of the small man exploiting whatever talent or resources that he's got. The other thing is this, and please don't continue to misrepresent. The labor movements in this country and democratic socialism's assertion has been of equality of opportunity, of access, of provision, and going with that. And going and opportunity. Oh, well, but you don't really mean it. You don't really mean it. And going and going with that, the denial of the excesses of inherited opportunity, inherited wealth, inherited privilege. Now you described that earlier as the politics of envy. It's not. Our pursuit of fairness has never been because of envy. It's been in order to reduce and preferably abolish the waste that comes from an inegalitarian, unequal society. And whilst I applaud the instincts of Milton Friedman, 
In practice, he has got the most implausible proposition of all, that somehow, spontaneously, those who have got their wealth and their position and their power and their influence, by the abuse of freedom, by dodging the obligations of civilization, will on the day that they become powerful, the day they become powerful, become, in their condescension, all their sense of fairness or Christianity or whatever else, great providers the remainder of people. Excuse me, so excuse me. That's a, that's a travesty in the first place. The main reason I believe in economic freedom is because I believe it's the only way to prevent the possessors of capital from having too much power. But they don't. You don't Excuse do me. If you start along your lines, your intentions may be fine, all your talk is fine, but the plain fact is that I know hardly any governmental program enacted in the name of equality which does not take from the poor to give to the middle and upper classes, as in the field of education, as in every other field. Well, it's the security of the civil service that is a major objective of most of these programs. If we take the programs that you have in this country to provide assistance to the so-called poor, one of the major effects has been to create the poor, to create a class of poor, a permanent class of poor, who are deprived of the instincts yeah. and the opportunity well, to do something about it. You, you take that I up with him because he's raised the marginal rate of tax on family income supplement and supplementary benefit families enormously. They're at 250% margin now. I want a world in which people are free to compete in order precisely to prevent people who have power from being able to use force over other people. Well, okay. The fundamental difficulty with your approach is that it requires the use of bad means for what you regard as good objectives. Oh. It's a road you, to hell that's there, paved with good intentions, yeah, as in Samuel Johnson put Professor Freedom, uh, haven't you heard of Henry Ford? Now, uh, here is a person who, by the accumulation of his power, not only exercised that economic power, when somebody challenged it, he got them beaten up. He got their legs broken. He got them tossed in the river. Excuse that's me. That's what happens. Henry Ford was a terrible man. <laughs> right. He was a man. No, but he did a great deal of good. Henry <laughs> Ford revolutionized transportation in the okay. United States. Right. From your point of view, he started the high wage arrangement. He was a man who put in the $5 a day you, wage in Detroit in order, saying the in, order to attract, yeah. in order to attract people from the South. Yeah. But he yes, didn't do it because he was a good man. He was a bad man. A good man is an irrelevance. The, the key That's point right. is whether one can moderate the behavior. I mean, essentially, one can have a world of the rat race, which is your pure equality of opportunity world. Now, we need the rat race world, I regret to say, because we need the incentives that rats respond to, which is the Henry Ford thing. The point is, can we not build a society which is not entirely rat race, which has some conception of a better way of life, and that is really what we're arguing about on this side. So the real issue is how you try to limit government power. The real issue, I'm not an anarchist. I don't believe that you can do without government. I think government has very important functions. And I think those functions include preventing people from coercing other people. It includes the national defense. It includes trying to maintain a stable money, a function in which government has been not <coughs> notoriously unsuccessful. It includes trying to maintain a competitive environment in which, in which competition prevails. What I am saying to you, is that when government goes beyond those purposes for the things you want to achieve, it ends up not achieving them. Mm. But as in the case of higher education, as in the case of industrial monopoly, almost every industrial monopoly exists only because of special privilege from government. Mm. In each of these cases, right. the government in the na does something in one name. The name is equality. The name is eliminating differences. The result is almost always to create positions, special positions of privilege, but rather than yeah, the if opposite. If we take those four conditions of the lay f uh, classic laissez-faire right. that you mentioned, of those, just uh, off the top of my head, this question of the national defense, that is which, uh, the factor which promotes monopoly relationships with government, more than anything else. And, uh, Not more than anything else. Well, it does. Oh, I right. agree oh, with it, you. It, it does. does. Very substantially promoted. Right. When you talk about the competitive environment and the role of government in pre uh, preventing bullying by one section of another, the problem is, in the, in, uh, of essence of the kind of society you want, that those who accumulate the economic power by their excellence, by their speculation, by their ability, by their toughness, whatever else, get into that position then get into the governmental position and actually promote the unfairness of competition and promote the uh, abuse <coughs> of 
the majority of the people by that minority that has power. But they don't. No, until, no, they no, don't that's why you've got they to face don't, up. They don't and shouldn't. But they do. If Neil, if Neil, Kinnick, Neil, Neil Kinnick talks all the time as if what we are in danger of having is a government uh, by the rich for the rich. Right. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about a plutocracy. We're talking about a democracy. We're talking about a situation where the, where the government is elected by the uh, majority of the ordinary people and can only be re-elected if it is approved of by, uh, by them. And the idea that somehow that, that, that what we're fighting against is a government yeah. by a tiny minority able to impose their will to make themselves richer still is nonsense. And Morris Pestner, it was very, very revealing too, when, uh, although he didn't fall into that particular fallacy, when he referred to the majority of ordinary people as rats. Uh, he, regar he regarded, yes, he regarded the instinct, the instinct which leads people to try and improve their own standard of living and try and create a better life for their children as rats. Well, obviously, someone who has that view naturally thinks that the people in government who are presumably not rats, uh, <laughs> but, but are, well, but are motivated, motivated yeah. by drive, higher motives, should, should uh, impose a pattern on a society quite different from what ordinary people want for themselves. I want to other... pursue this red, red metaphor no, too no, far. No, no, but I, I want to go to one other point that is suggested by this, but it's not exactly the same metaphor. I think there's a great misconception to interpret self-interest as narrow, selfish interest. I think that an Einstein, a Newton, a Florence Nightingale are pursuing their self-interest. The great scholars are pursuing their self-interest. A world of freedom is a world in which some people are free to make money. Other people are free to pursue the arts. Still other people are free to go live in communes if they want to. There's nothing wrong with a society in which if, uh, if Neil Kinnock doesn't like the uh, rat race, he can go and form a commune with some of his... I would ten minutes in a commune. <laughs> <laughs> any, more, any more than you would. So that do not interpret. Just as... Uh, I hate this misuse of language. You introduced a distortion of language earlier, Mr. Kinnock, that I wanted to correct. Monetarism is a technical question of the relationship between money and income. It has nothing to do with the issues we've been talking about. We've been talking about issues of an altogether different kind. In addition, promoting one's own interest, as Adam Smith said, is not the same thing as pure selfishness. It's not the same thing as gangsterism. It's not rat race. It's each of us as human beings doing the things we believe in. But First, let me bring it back to, to economics for a moment, but a very fundamental question of economics. You believe passionately in the free economy, the free market. You believe in it because each consumer, each participant is free to make his own decisions. You believe it throws up a, a rational, an optimum distribution of resources because producers will respond to the signals they get from the consumer through prices in the market. Now, the whole thing depends on the assumption that we can attach equal weight to each spending decision per dollar, per pound, that the consumer makes in the marketplace. And then we assume that the market, or we hope or believe, the market will beautifully integrate through the invisible hand all those things into an efficient and optimal result. Now, even supposing all the mechanism works as beautifully as it's supposed to, doesn't it critically depend on the assumption that each pound represents, as it were, equal ethical weight in the first place when it's spent? And if the incomes from which it is spent are grossly or even substantially unequal, isn't that basic premise invalidated? No, I don't think it does depend on them. It depends. Uh, it does say a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. You do have voting with dollars. There's no particular merit in voting with dollars in and of itself. It has no ethical value. The system itself has no ethical value. The ethical value has to be in the result, in the consequences of the system. And now the important thing there is in that kind of a system, the example I used in one of these films was uh, the Rockefeller family. Accumulated great wealth. Where did they accumulate great wealth? By producing more. By making the oil industry in a much more rational, efficient, effective, productive industry. As private individuals, they used a great deal of that wealth for good purposes, setting up the Rockefeller Foundation, restoring Williamsburg, financing my own University of Chicago. But then, I take Nelson Rockefeller, and he becomes governor of the state of New York. He does vastly more harm in his political capacity than he ever could have done harm as a private individual. He imposes taxes on the people in New York to, Im to build monuments. He destroys private universities in order to build a state university of New York in his own image. What's the difference? Because the money he spends does not come from greater production. See, the great difference is that in a fr free market economy, 
Those extra dollars you're talking about correspond to greater product. They don't come at the expense of other people. Whereas government can only get money by taking it from some to give it to others. And that's the fundamental ethical difference between a voluntary arrangement in which you and I exchange what we produce, in which your income corresponds to whatever products you've been able to achieve, and a system in which you can send a policeman to take money out of my pocket to do something that you or he thinks is desirable. But then you must start to look at the facts. And you see, the thing that puzzles some of us as we read your writings and other writings is, first of all, we don't understand how you come to the conclusion that our own society is unfree, which you seem to come to the conclusion. Your own society is in large measure free. You well, have it seems large to us elements that we live in a very free society and a society that's freer now than it was during the great era of laissez faire capitalism. That's right. And that's a fundamental proposition which perhaps you'll disagree with, but we feel yes, that. Yes, I do. Then, of course, if you take another society not a long way from us, which is richer than ours, which is Sweden, we don't get the impression, some of us, that when we look at Sweden, that they are less free than we are, even though they have a rather more socialist arrangement in your terms. Um, and we are, actually, some of us think that Sweden's at least as free a country as the United States. <laughs> Equally, we don't regard the United States as freer than we are. And therefore, there seems to me to be no correlation between, in the range we're discussing, I'm not discussing the, the Soviet-Russia case, right. because it we, seems to me that Soviet-Russia is not a free society, it's intrinsically not a free society, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the mixed economy and varying the mixture. Now, my argument with you is that as I move what you might call to the left end of the mixture, as opposed to the writer end, I on the whole don't believe that the issue is, 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 a, is a fundamental one of that over that range of freedom. It seems but to me that one is basically interfering a little here to improve that uh, and, and sometimes succeeding and sometimes failing. Uh, and I would have thought that many of your colleagues in America take exactly the same view. They don't really see freedom threatened if the marginal rate of tax goes from 25 to 30%. And I personally don't believe that whatever the consequences of the present government's policies, that somehow freedom has suddenly gone up in the nine months because, the last nine months because the marginal rate of tax has gone down. Right. And therefore it seems to me that your, your position is somehow... It, it, sort of, it, it doesn't come to grips with the, with the real problem. Um, you a final comment from you, Professor. All right. There are great restrictions on freedom in this country. A man in this country is not free to pursue the occupation he wishes. He is not free to enter into certain kinds of businesses without a government permit. Until recently, he was not free to take his money from Britain and send it over to America. He was free to move personally. It was not as bad as in Russia, where he cannot, as a human being, uh, emigrate. But it's only a matter of degree whether you refuse to give him permission to take his property or refuse to give him permission to take himself. He is not free to spend his own money that he earns as much a as he wishes. There are many restrictions on freedom in the United States. The same arrangements are true. I am not free to go into the business of carrying mail for profit. I am not free to offer my services as a physician unless I have a license from the state. Quite right, too. There are many, many areas in I which I'm not you're a free. Surgeon, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor Friedman, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Nigel Lawson, Morris Peston, and Neil Kinnock, thank you very much indeed. That argument has been going on, I suppose, about as long as there have been societies. How equal or unequal should societies be by what means? Is it legitimate or not legitimate to try to intervene in that? But uh, for the purposes of this program, that's as far as we can take it. Thank you very much indeed, and we hope that you will join us next Saturday for our next discussion of another aspect of Professor Friedman's economic philosophy.